Let's run into the lair, guys. Hey, welcome to this week's Into the Lair. Like I said last week, we're going to do several shows on vocals. And so this show, we're at the Boom Boom Room, Will Smith Studio. We're talking with uh, Andrew Whooper and Brian B. Love Thomas. And uh, a part of the Red Zone team, they are. That sounded like... Uh, like Yoda did it, a part of the Red Zone team they are. Anyway, uh, um, uh, we're missing part of the team. Coop Carell, who's a, a vital part of the team, does he records vocals and, and produces vocals, incredible vocal producer, and is a good producer in his own right, too. I guess I'm an honorary member of the Red Zone team. Absolutely. Right? Okay, good. Absolutely. I just want to make sure I didn't lose my Red Zone card. No, no. Do you have different thought processes for different genres and sure. different genders? Absolutely. Just take me through that real quick, B. Well, Basically, I always have a basic mic setup. Um, mic selection can go anywhere between vintage to what's going on right now to the newer, like a C800 Sony, back to a vintage Telefunken 251, which is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, the U47, classic go to. If I have one available, I'm using it. Right. But you still got to listen to them because, you know, some of them get beat up. There's been times where, like, it's a 47. Why does my vocal sound like this? It's not my set, oh, mm -hmm. mic pre or whatever. It's the mic. Is there a microphone that you guys use that would shock the world and everybody would say, I would have never thought they used that on sure. vocals? Sure. Um, we use uh, U87 <laughs> on a lot of stuff, um, especially, like, rap vocals. Um, you know, like B was saying, some of the vintage mics tend to get beat up really badly sometimes, especially with vocalists who have really powerful voices that carry. Mm -hmm. They can really, really crush the diaphragm of the microphone. Carry. Like, power oh, in the their carry. voice. I thought you were talking about Mariah Carey. No, no. no. <laughs> well, her, she might be one, too. She, yeah. she is one. If you don't have the right mic on her, you're right. just going to uh, crap out the diaphragm. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you need a mic that can really take a beating. So, U87, you know, as long as your gain structure is good, you know, mine your surroundings, mind the acoustics, mind the gain staging, and even with a cheaper mic like a U87, you can get a good tone out of it, and you won't have to be constantly monitoring the position of the vocalist to the microphone, um, because, uh -huh. you know, in some cases, they do tend to blow out that mic uh -huh. with a more sensitive mic, like a 251 or a uh -huh. U47. What is your preamp of choice? Do you guys tend to use the same preamp all the time, or is there a go-to preamp, or do you have different preamps you like? Well, I basically use a few different ones, but my favorite is going to be the Neve. Like the 1070, like the 1073. 1073 or the 1081. I mean, I can deal with the 1073 most because I don't EQ that much to tape. If anything, I might roll off a little bit of low end, but not too much, just something I hear. But you would. Um, definitely the 1073. Um, Sometimes we may use a crane song flamingo. Um, we use that a couple times with um, Kook and his engineer Josh, who's incredible too. Yeah, I think the 1073 these days is probably the. It's the. Yeah, it's, it's it like just the, works. It just it colors has the right color has the right exactly uh, characteristics. And it's, and it's great for instruments too because it has a direct end. So I use a lot of guitars through yeah. it. Break down what you guys mean um, by gain structure and how you manipulate that to get the sound you want. Well, basically, on let's say for instance on. Uh, like a 251 mic, just generally, that's what I'm using. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll do, I'll have the artist go in the room, of course, you know, the track's playing so they can just start hearing themselves, and I don't have anything set up because I don't know what they're going to do until they get in there, you know, it mm -hmm. just, I might know the song, so their vocal might come in really loud, so I'm not compressing yet. I so you're either. always ready to, whatever they sing, yes, you I'm, got yeah, I'm, I'm oh, adjusting yeah. on the fly, I never use presets, because right. I, I can't, because... You I never start know. coloring my songs all the same way. Whatever song that is, it needs to sound like this. I'm adjusting on the fly all the time. All the time. You too, every section. Absolutely. And, every and section, section to section, too, like he said. Um, you know, you're obviously not going to be recording a really intimate, maybe breathier, quiet vocal the same way as, you know, Christina belting in a vamp. Like, it's you're going to have to adjust. You have to ride the compressor, ride the threshold in the compressor, because in some of those quieter spaces, you know, you, you may be setting your compressor to a certain level and it may be bright. And then when she starts wailing, you're going to be, you know, killing all the dynamics in that vocal performance. So you constantly have to be adjusting, constantly have to be writing, constantly have to be thinking about the performance of the record and, and how the record changes from section to section. Cool. So very important to do that when you're recording. You know, never set recording vocals is never a set it and forget it process ever. <laughs> like a rotisserie. <laughs> yeah, and and keeping 
you know, going with the with the gain st gain structure uh, thing. Um, there there is a kind of a common misconception out there for the in, in the schools, recording schools, and 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 younger engineers who are coming up that you have to record your levels to Pro Tools as hot as possible without clipping. That's absolutely untrue. Maybe in a 16-bit recording world that was more true, but yeah. now that we're in a 24-bit recording world, you could set your levels pretty moderate into Pro Tools. Um, you know, you have a lot of, you know, a lot of dynamic range and bit depth to work with within uh, your gain structure. So, you know, set your level to your um, mic pre conservative, and then maybe use your output gain of your compressor to use that to do the actual gain staging into Pro Tools. But keep it moderate. You know, like you don't have to be recording super hot. Um, you know, keep it nice. In in the middle, you know, just mm -hmm. listen to listen for it and yeah. trust your ears. That's the biggest trust thing. Your ears, yeah. That's the biggest thing I can I can biggest piece of advice is just trust your ears and trust your instincts. My ears are a little larger than bees. Does that mean I'm I'm a better engineer than bees? <laughs> you might be able to cover more ground. <laughs> you guys have been involved with uh, a lot of different genres. Mm -hmm. Do you notice a different? Uh, Mic, mic placement, mic this, mic that, with like, say, if you're working on a rock project as opposed to like, say, because you guys do everything from rock to Celine Dion. Absolutely. It's to rap to everything. Yeah. There's, I mean, it is absolutely a difference. Um, uh, a lot of times we will, will like B was mentioning earlier, earlier, we may have a chain that we start out with. Um, like the classic chain we use is the Neve 1073. The Tube Tech CL1B compressor, which is a great tube compressor, um, my favorite for vocals. And then we'll go out of that into an Apogee Rosetta 800. We'll go in analog and then come out digital into Pro Tools, and that's how we do our A to D conversion. So on the on the Rosetta, do you use any of the built-in limiting or compressing? Or Absolutely not. Not when we're recording. Not when you're um, recording. I mean, that, the soft limit on those is sort of kind of like... You know, it's it's kind of like its own built-in L2, and and when you're recording vocals, I mean, we're trying to get the it's least much. amount of compression. Like we want dynamics, yeah, dynamics, and if we need to control the dynamics after the fact, we can do that after the fact. But we we don't we never like to record with too much compression ever. Maybe a dB or two at the most. Okay. What what uh, what's your start off attack and release times? Do you know them in milliseconds, or do you or you just know them by just where the knob goes? I just go by, by where the knob is. is. <laughs> generally, like, you're in the usually, 100 to 200 millisecond range yeah, it's on pretty, the attack. Pretty, you know, again, moderate on both. Yeah, just, again, just depending depending it, it it also depends on the um, the type of vocal performance you're capturing. If it's a rap vocal, then you may need a little bit faster attack. Um, if it's you know, depending on how much of the peaks and the dynamics you want to control, you know, if you want the vocal to be really, really dynamic, you may set a slower attack time. It just really depends on the vocal performance you're capturing. You know, if I hear something audibly in the compression that's bothering me, mm -hmm. you know, when we start out, then it may prompt me to make a decision to change something. Mm -hmm. But normally, we don't really change those two knobs right there. And B, uh, what 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 ratio do you tend to to, to use? When I start out, two I keep one, it around three about three to one, but I usually dial it down. Down meaning yeah, two, about to one. two to one to sometimes even well with the CL1B it's really sensitive. It's a very transparent compressor too, and so. it doesn't you know. What does what what are you listening for when you make the decision to dial?